meeting. And so I guess, I guess I'll get started. So hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to our Vectors Angel second deal day. So yeah, so today we're going to have amazing pitches from 15 companies that um, are, you know, focused on like impact investments. Uh, we have, you know, several different areas ranging from sustainability to women's health to, you know, fishery software. And so i um, really excited to have you guys here, both in angel investors and um, startups. Um, just a little couple of logistics in this meeting. I So basically, um, we'll have a little bit of intro in the beginning. So Jane will walk us through kind of introducing Victor's Angel a little bit. And then each startup will come in and present in order. So basically, like startups will have five minutes to pitch. And then we will have another three minutes for investors to fill up our poll about that startup. And we'll use that poll to be our kind of indicator of, you know, like to decide whether we'll conduct like further due diligence with the startups. Um, but in any case, um, we'll definitely like, we're more than welcome to pass, kind of like connect you guys with the startup if you're interested. And so, like in any case, like feel free to reach out to me or to anybody in our team to get connected. And so, you know, after, so during the three minutes of polling, like the next startup will, will kind of like work on like screen sharing and stuff. And so we, I want to kindly ask all like uh, for the startups not to fill out investors polls so that like we don't get confused. Um, and other than that, I guess like I'll hand it over to Jane. Um, Jane. Hello, everyone. Can you? Oh, talk? you want you need to stop share? Uh, well, you, you can just uh, we use the same uh, PowerPoint. Yeah. So yeah, cool. you can you can just uh, flip for me. Okay, cool. Yeah, let me know if you wanna move. Yeah. To the next page. All right. So, uh, hello. My name is Jane. Um, so I'm the uh, funding manager of Vectors Angel. Uh, okay, flip to the next one. Okay. Yeah, so this is an angel community uh, for uh, angel investors who are passionate about uh, impact investment. And uh, we want to uh, we want to find the uh, companies that bring both uh, great financial returns and uh, positive uh, societal environmental benefits to the society. Uh, all together, and we're really glad to see all of you here today uh, joining. Next. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we only uh, support venture attract positive impact uh, companies, and that's why we are called a vector. We, uh, we believe a positive impact and financial return can, uh, can join uh, hands in hand and also um, cover those underserved sector value. Uh, uh, such as sustainability uh, that you know, investors do not really have uh, in that knowledge of, but we have the team that we have the, the knowledge of um, helping the angel investors to navigate through those sectors. Okay, next. So we have two focus areas, one in sustainability and one in healthcare wellness. Uh, so it's pretty broad. Uh, we welcome companies and fit um, marginally or you know into those areas uh, to be joining in our uh, our pitch, uh, our events, and to be considered for uh, investment. Go on. Go on. next. Go down. One second. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the current process of how it work is okay. that the entrepreneurs are um, uh, They join our uh, the deal day uh, like the one it is today, and we also have you know me pitch days to our deal team almost every week, um, and uh, we'll review the facts uh, together with the uh, with the startups. And uh, we complete the technical and business due diligence 
um, of the of the companies and uh, our if our deal team uh, is very excited to uh, invest in ourselves uh, we'll uh, publicly um, call for a syndicate for other investors to join in um, and if for any reason we have decided to not move forward to call for a formal syndicate uh, and we think the company still might be interesting to the investor network will um, put it onto our newsletter and then let everyone know and they can work with those companies all together. Uh, so the DD process we use is, uh, is a seed level venture investor um, or you know seed above. So if a company is super, super early, uh, uh, pre-seed or still in the concept level, we typically do a pass for those, uh, but maybe this company are to totally fine and super exciting for you. And we encourage you to work with them individually. Oops. You can click that narrow down. Yeah. 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 So uh, this is where the entrepreneurs submit their deck. Go to the website uh, vectors.earth. Uh, if you want to be considered for the uh, for the deal day uh, Lexus or uh, our mini pitch uh, weekly pitch days, um, you can submit their deck here. Uh, we'll, we'll reach out to you if we, we think your company fit on, into our theme uh, and it's worth uh, looking into. Next one. And if you're an investor, uh, also go to the website. Uh, you fill out your investment uh, preference uh, so we know a little bit more about you. Um, and, uh, but the, after you sign it, sign it up, uh, in the end, you will also see a link to join our Slack channel. Uh, so you'll be able to, you know, chat with each other if you want to, and uh, some of the, the, the discussions are also carried out in the Slack channel. Yes. Next one. Yeah, so we use Azure as a syndication platform, and they do cover seven years of the, uh, of the management of uh, syndicate, so we don't need to worry too much about uh, the, the legal and uh, tax issues uh, after we form the syndicate with Assure. And if you're interested, we also uh, constantly welcome you to join our deal team and there are two ways to join it. Uh, if you're really an uh, experienced investor, uh, we, we welcome you to join the venture partner route. Um, so you have to have the uh, background, a strong track record for uh, neither system, uh, for sustainability or uh, healthcare area. Um, and uh, you're welcome to bring deals in uh, if you know uh, there's a company you're super excited about, uh, but you want to work with us on full due diligence, uh, or you you're just like really excited to work with us. Uh, we welcome you to join our deal team. And the other one is the investment fellow program. Uh, it's uh, designed for relatively uh, younger um, uh, uh, professionals. Uh, and also maybe students uh, who are really excited uh, to learn about impact investing or just venture investment in general to apply for this fellowship program. Um, and uh, the next uh, round of application will be open around November for next year to consider. And we also welcome mentors to provide any support to the company as well. So go down. Next slide. Yes. Yeah, so uh, as mentioned, this is a four months uh, program, four to, uh, four to six months uh, fellowship program for, uh, for people who want to join our deal team. It's a pretty selective process, um, but we, we encourage you to consider applying if uh, this is something you're very excited about. Okay, I will pass it to Ping Ping, who is our deal day manager uh, of today, and to go over the, the companies and the rest of the logistics. Thank you all. It's great to have you today. Both the investors. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Yep. So basically, like for next will be the pitches. We have, you know, 15 companies. The order is exactly here. Um, and then, so basically like we'll have five minute 
each for each company and then you know for the next three minutes we'll have a poll out for uh, each investor um the rest oh and then we we won't have q a but basically we will you know allow you guys to feel free to send messages to chat either like uh, to everyone so that other people can see your questions and answers or um, you could also chat the startups privately but i would really recommend if not if it's not it won't be sorry if it's not too confusing to share your questions with the audience so that like um other investors could see your um your the answers to your questions as well um we have a really nice turnout today so i want to thank you very much again for joining us um is there any like quick questions on the um, the logistics right now. All right. Um, if there's anything. Yeah, I, this is, I'm sorry. I, this is a Ted. Uh, I, sorry. I took, have a, a question regarding, uh, the, uh, the operation of the SPV. You said 20% of the carry would be used for like the, the, uh, the process and management. Um, my question is without complete, the uh, the entire process and and having an exit, how do you know the carry uh, the amount of carry that you can use for the operation of S SPV? Um, okay, oh, it is all preset in the Azure platform. It's whole. It's a deal team. It goes to the deal team. It's just like a mini VC for for every single company. But the carry the amount of carry. I, I understand the mechanism, but I, 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 my question is the amount of carry is unknown until the, um, you know, the completion of the SPV, right? For yes, if exactly. you. Yes. All right. Cool. Yeah. If there's other, any other questions, feel free to uh, ping us in the chat. Um, yeah, so just a recap about our deal day that this is like not a demo day um, and it's our initial screening of the companies and your um, participation in our polls will help us with our decisions. And so, well, we usually have deal days every three months, so basically every quarter. And so like startups, if you want to spread out the word, like all startups that are falling to area of like major impact areas, are welcome to apply. We focus on any type of sustainability and healthcare. Um, All right. Um, and then we prefer like seed stage companies and strong products with customer traction before scaling. Um, and then, yeah, um, for VCs, if you wanted to do like due diligence with us, then feel free to collaborate and given that um let's i'll hand it over to matt from access Earth to start the pitch great and i'm gonna share my screen okay can everyone see my screen again all right, perfect. Cool. So, um, yeah, thanks everyone for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you a bit more about Access Earth. Uh, so, my name is uh, Matt. I am the CEO and founder. Um, and I started Access Earth based on my own experience and uh, struggles with finding up to date and reliable accessibility information. Um, I have cerebral palsy, and that means uh, as a result, my mobility is affected and I'm dependent on knowing if a building, business, shop, or restaurant is accessible for my needs before I begin my journey. Uh, this is a universal issue that affects more than just myself, but addressing it also provides a massive opportunities for many. Uh, the mission at Access Earth is really to create the world's largest accessibility database. We're both a data provider, a data aggregator, and a data gatherer. And with our dynamic accessibility database, we can empower people uh, to do more through data and to allow businesses to tap into a lucrative yet under catered for a global market. 
because there are over 1 billion people in the world with accessibility needs. That's about 15% of the world's population. Uh, globally, they have a spending power of over $8 trillion and tend to spend upwards of 1.8 times more than non-disabled people in the entertainment area. However, the market's not really being served as over 65% of this population uh, don't spend on travel or leisure due to a lack of reliable accessibility information. Uh, the current processes to attract the market either rely too heavily on human resources and aren't scalable, or they require bespoke digital solutions that are expensive or don't integrate well with existing infrastructure. Um, existing solutions either don't provide enough information while also being prohibitively expensive at scale. Our platform works by uh, taking in data from not just the access or crowdsourcing application, which has over 100, 110,000 uh, locations gathered at the moment currently, um, and also our newly developed AI powered satellite image classifier, uh, which we've already completed a report on accessible parking with, with uh, Smart Dublin. As well as this, we also take in existing accessibility data from third party sites or publicly stored data that is yet to be formatted. Uh, the platform takes this information and provides it to our customers in their preferred format, primarily through API access or with an integrated plugin. Um, this information can then be kept up to date through our data gathering tools or directly from the customers. Uh, we're at our core really a data licensing company with an innovative and unique ways for gathering and distributing data. Our focus is primarily in the area of accessibility and we've recently also included COVID-19 relevant criteria in order to broaden our offerings, but also remain kind of true to our mission statement. Presently, uh, we targeted key customer groups and we'll be focusing on those kind of throughout four initial phases. Currently, we're in phase zero, where we've completed a number of community mapping events with local authorities, access networks, and private businesses. We're working with Smart Sandyford and other local authorities to deploy examples in our current product. Uh, phase one is where we target large sporting bodies. Um, particularly those that are because particularly those in football because they've a proven track record at spending consistently and deeply to facilitate their disabled fans needs uh, while already have made great headway within certain clubs in this route to market. Uh, phase two, we use that experience to um, deliver to larger international events such as the Paralympic Games and the European Football Championships next year. And then in phase three, we focus on securing national contracts with government bodies that we deploy countrywide. Uh, through asset mapping, smart analytics, and uh, just statistics in general. Um, this is currently at a later stage as the lead times are quite sizable, but throughout the entire process, we are um, hoping to foster these relationships moving forward. Uh, myself, Donal, and Robbie are full-time in terms of the team, while Kira, along with two other members, are part-time. Uh, and with funding, we look to expand our full-time tech team to six, so that also expansion to sales and tech. Um, currently, we have a 300,000 round open at the moment with 150,000 left uh, due to close in the next couple of months. Um, this will enable us to expand our team to both improve the deployment of our robust product and uh, help to secure sales um, and other opportunities that have been afforded to us by our strategic partners. Uh, thank you very much for your time and um, looking forward to speaking with you again soon. Thanks, Matt. That's perfectly on time. Okay, now we'll, if you have any Q&As, um, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I'll pull, open up the poll for investors. Let's see, I'll launch it. Everyone see the poll, I guess? Yeah, um, investors, please fill it out. Um, I want to kindly ask uh, startups to not um, fill out this, this poll. Ooh, the first person filled in. Yay. All right. Um, I guess. Let's see. Um, ben, like from Vacuum Interpreted, you could start the setup if you want. Oh, let's see. I...
All right, 30 seconds left for the poll. All right, one second left. Okay. Cool. Um, <clears throat> all right, Ben, um, yeah, you could have a go now. Thank you uh, for inviting me this evening. My name is uh, Ben Davis. I'm a former Harvard scientist and public markets investor. And I'm here to talk about vacuum therapeutics a company that I started after my wife developed severe lactose intolerance. Vacuum Therapeutics is, developing a th is a C-stage biotech developing treatments for functional GI disorders. This is a landmine. 34 million Americans have a functional GI disorder and live with a landmine in their bowels. One wrong meal and boom, your day is ruined. For patients with Functional GI disorders, tiny amounts of certain carbohydrates are fermented, producing gases, most importantly hydrogen, that triggers cramping and bloating severe enough for you to have to put your entire life on hold and simply wait for your symptoms to pass. As these patients' testimonials say, the symptoms themselves can flare up at any time, even, for instance, driving. But what is even more oppressive than the symptoms themselves is the all-encompassing fear that at any time your entire day could be wiped away from you. This fear exists because no therapy can effectively treat patients once symptoms flare up. The reason symptoms develop is that certain carbohydrates are fermented in the large intestine, producing gas which stretches the intestinal wall and in functional GI patients, induces cramping and bloating. Our lead compound, BTO3, removes gas by reacting with hydrogen to reduce intestinal pressure and symptoms. This is the first therapeutic that allows us to provide relief to patients after symptoms develop. We do this by binding with hydrogen to produce a solid. By using a chemical reaction, we're able to use a remove 150 times greater volume of gas per gram than traditional gas absorbents, allowing us to remove both a clinically meaningful volume of gas and to do so in a convenient oral pill format. But what's really exciting about this approach is that is that the constituents of the drug are so safe that they are considered food by the FDA. This, this means that they are amenable to an accelerated timeline to a major um, value inflection point, first in human trials. In addition, our IP is strong and broad, claiming all substrates, combinations of a substrate and catalyst that is capable of removing hydrogen. The unmet need we're addressing is an immense market. Roughly one third of the US population suffers from carbohydrate intolerance. Our business model is to develop a drug to target the most severely affected patients before expanding the indication over the product life cycle to include larger groups, such as those with lactose intolerance. We estimate that in the beachhead market alone, revenues of $1.1 billion are achievable within six years of launch. The reason we will win in this market is simple. We are the only therapeutic capable of providing acute relief to symptoms triggered by food. All other treatments are merely preventative. And by allowing patients to control and not simply manage the symptoms, we're a life-changing therapy that's uniquely valuable to our patients. We have assembled an outstanding team to turn this vision into reality. Victoria Campbell, my co-founder, is a skilled surface scientist, experiencing, experienced in delivering multidisciplinary projects. We were advised by Gio Traverso, an MIT professor who's an expert in intestinal drug disorder, and by Dr. Kyle Stoller, director of the gastrointestinal motility lab at MGH, and an expert in functional GI disorders. What we are asking for today is $1.5 million to demonstrate the efficacy of our therapeutic in an animal model and discharge a significant technical risk. We will use this value inflection point to raise funds for human proof of concept studies necessary to secure favorable exit opportunities. Because we are regulated as a food, we have a rapid path to this value inflection point between three to six years. Now is the time to invest in vacuum therapeutics for two distinct reasons. 
Firstly, a better understanding of the biology of functional GI disorders has proven the efficacy of treating intestinal gas to better manage symptoms. Yet today, no therapeutics have been developed to, tar to target gas because it is simply not suitable for traditional drug modalities. And secondly, big pharma interest in food intolerances has demonstrated the favorable exit opportunities and timelines to therapeutics that can manage food-related intolerances. In summary, by investing in vacuum therapeutics, you're gaining exposure to a de-risk technology whose ability to provide acute relief to functional GI symptoms will allow us to win a billion dollar market. In the process, you can also be happy in the knowledge that you made millions of people feel quite a bit better. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Ben. Um, I'll Pull up the poll. Um, poll and Q and A's are in the chat. Oh, and thanks, Ben, for the for the deck. All right. So now we'll have um, Oya. You could come like set up this set up your presentation. Okay, we will wait for about two minutes and 30 seconds. All right, we have one minute left for the poll. Um, All right, 30 seconds. All right, perfect. Um, Oya, um, you can start your pitch. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Ola, and I'm the CEO of Frost Methane Labs. Um, what we're working on doesn't need any introduction, so we work on uh, the climate change problem, and specifically we work on the methane portion of it. So while CO2 definitely gets uh, a lot of the attention, methane is responsible for 20% of the warming that we experience today, and per molecule it's 28 times more potent. So what we do is we find concentrated sources, and then we convert the methane to CO2 and water automatically, also known as flaring. Um, the way that we um, uh, monetize this is that there's carbon offset markets that pay quite highly for flared methane. 
So for example, the California cap and trade market pays $425 per ton of methane that you neutralize and the European Union markets pay even more. So these carbon offset markets are already pretty large and they're um, probably about to double in the next 10 years or so. Um, the next question is, of course, what are these methane sources that we're tackling? And so we find things that are very concentrated and continuous in nature so that we can install our devices on there in order to do the continuous conversion. Um, the three types of uh, sources that we look at that are ones that are also qualified in the carbon offset market are natural vents, um, abandoned coal mines that continue to produce methane even after uh, they're done being exploited, and active mines which also produce 2% uh, of all climate change emissions from just the waste methane that's produced. Um, now, wh we've interviewed uh, quite a few companies that purchase carbon offsets, uh, as well as brokers, and have gotten extremely positive responses in an LOI and um, you know, are kind of working on a, on a contract with, uh, with some brokers. Uh, and what they really look for is very high quality, so like, actually mitigating the emissions, easy to measure, easy to verify. Um, a lot of companies do prefer methane-based offsets because they're much easier to, to measure compared to forestry. Um, and of course, has to meet all of the regulatory requirements that these companies are under. Like in compliance markets, they have to either reduce or offset their emissions. And typically, uh, often reducing isn't quite possible. Um, so they need some kind of a solution. Um, the technologies that we uh, leveraged and built over the last year and a half to do this has been, uh, first, we need to find these places, right? So there's a mix of satellite and various database combinations in order to find where we have the largest potential. Um, we then built a, a, a miniaturized flaring system as well as our monitoring system, which is actually now starting to get some um, attention from oil and gas in order to have very precise measurements uh, suited for carbon offset uh, purposes of how much emissions we're eliminating which are about 10 times cheaper than anything that we can get off the market. Um, so we've uh, successfully deployed uh, an Arctic, a device in the Arctic on one of these uh, methane, methane flares um, or on one of these methane vents. Um, and now we've applied this learning to, uh, to coal mine operations. So we're currently in negotiation to secure two target sites. Um, and you know, in the future, we really hope to uh, expand to basically all of the available uh, uh, methane sources, which would reduce about 5% of the global methane emissions. These markets are international. Um, you know, we also uh, hope that with the current interest from the oil and gas industry, we may be able to just sell our uh, monitoring system to them for a slightly different purpose. So there's kind of uh, easy additionalities there. Um, and finally, of course, the team is, uh, the team is by far the strongest uh, thing about any early stage company. So um, I was a team lead at Google Energy and worked on early stage projects at Google X that spun out as Dandelion and Malta. We've got a crew uh, that uh, has built devices that last in harsh conditions from the nuclear industry to rocketry to underwater robotic. And uh, we have an amazing, uh, uh, we have Megan Kleeman who has taken uh, a project from idea to multi-million to 160 million in valuation um, that uh, has recently turned from an advisor to, to working with us uh, more. And so finally, what we're trying to do is really the, the true triple bottom line. We, uh, we're looking to decrease uh, the ozone that, that happens when lots of methane gets into the atmosphere. Um, the, uh, the upper kind of limit of our success would be 500 megatons of CO2 equivalent. So that's like taking 100 million cars off the road. And finally, we really want to do this profitably so that we can scale quickly and make money for our investors, um, where the profitability, the gross margins that we're looking at for our chosen projects are about 70%. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Olya. Um, I'll pull up the um, let's see. Something. Cool. All right, and um, Hassan, are you here? All right, Hassan, you can go ahead and set up the um, the screen share.
kick it to him. All right, um, 30 seconds left for the poll. Five seconds, three, two, one. Cool. All right, Hassan, um, go ahead. Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, excited to be here. It's actually almost 4 a.m. in my time zone, uh, but as excited as it's daytime. Uh, I'll, I'll be pitching today about a new hot topic, which is uh, HVAC unexpectedly it used to be unsexy uh, but uh, now we are uh, working hard for our buildings to keep, keep us safe in post-COVID world and I'll tell you about what we are doing and how we're offering into market the most scalable uh, air quality enterprise level uh, indoor air quality solution so now let's say in a building in a commercial space even if this is a one building, the staff cannot keep up, like too many variables out there, too many alarms, too many complaints. So it's like dynamic, a living entity. And a few people in a living example as in HSBC, only in Turkey, they have more than 7,000 employees, like hundreds of branches. Uh, they, just because of they cannot standard, maintain the standard, uh, they lose more than a million dollar employee productivity loss just because of a poor indoor air quality. And the reason is they contract usually with companies like JLL. They assign three people for like almost 100 branches. Of course, they need tens of people to control their spaces, their air. And this is not only for HSBC, 99% of the market is being controlled by only one single parameter, temperature. But this is actually terribly wrong. Like the air we breathe is like a soup. We have CO2 in it. We have a lot of particles. We have viruses. We have humidity. So someone needs to understand all of these and needs to manage the building, the spaces accordingly and need to tell someone to uh, like what to do in an affordable, scalable, uh, and uh, simple manner. This is where we come in. And what we've developed out there is a totally plug and play sensor solution that is uh, quite performing well, self calibrating. We can measure up to 10 parameters from temperature up to very tiny particles in the air. You know, we enable facility managers to learn to enable a more data driven control. And up on top of that, we built the transparency between the companies and their customers, visitors, and employees. The team has been uh, working in this industry more, more than 15 years now. Uh, from from uh, Silicon Valley to Gulf region, we've been working on energy optimization, smart buildings, building sciences, and clean tech. And we came together three years ago to establish uh, a, a breakthrough smart building technology. And now uh, we've been working on this more than uh, two years. Right now, uh, right now, what? Okay. So, but the timing for for the market is 
like the market for air quality has been uh, evolving, but this is now the time that we can offer the right model for the market as pay as you go model. And the pricing is usually uh, depending on the number of notes we offer. And also we totally offer a monthly subscription fee. Usually the average quote we sent is $800 a month. And right now, up to now, we've sent 20K MRR quotations then, and half of that was uh, in the last two weeks. And as the product is now catching up, we are aiming to send 200K MRR quotations. All of the leads are uh, lined up. Most of them are in the GCC region. And uh, we've right now signed uh, six MOUs in five different countries. Uh, our regional goal is right now the Gulf region and our, our head office is in Singapore. So next we'll be uh, targeting Southeast Asia. And we've also signed uh, two MOUs over there in Malaysia and Philippines. We'll be going to market with companies like building providers, ESCOs, and IT sales partnerships so that we will push them with uh, finder's fees. Usually we offer 20% of commission over the subscription over the next three years. This is very attractive for them. And up to now, we've been we've got recognized uh, with some some important uh, institutions. We we were uh, picked up by Forbes, and uh, right now uh, we're quite dedicated to uh, collaborate with our key clients, partners, and drive towards more uh, healthier buildings and spaces. And right now, we're looking for a 100k angel round to extend our runway three more months. Currently, we have eight months of runway, and then. Uh, come up with a full uh, VC round. Right now, the goal is to accelerate our commercialization in the region. Like a lot of features we need to implement uh, to customers uh, to to make them happy. So right now we need to grow our development team locally here in Istanbul so that uh, we will have a much better valuation and a uh, much better ticket in, 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 in the mid 2021. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, feel free to shoot any questions and uh, I'm here to chat offline as well. All right, thanks Hassan. Um, we're... All right, I'll set up the poll. Um, I guess Paul, uh, you could set up your slides right now. One minute left for the poll.
30 seconds. All right, cool. Um, that's the end of the poll. Um, and Paul, I think you can go ahead and start. All right, thank you, Pinpin Pin and team, uh, for the invitation to participate today. And hello, everyone. I'm Paul Hare, the CEO of Encasa Healthcare. Uh, given the format of uh, five minutes with no questions, I'm, I'm going to spend more time talking and uh, really not cover much in terms of slides. But uh, just to paint the big picture before I do so, um, to be very brief, in CASA, what we do is we sell smart logistics software uh, to home healthcare providers who are our customers. And what the AI software does, it automates logistics and forecast demands, enabling those customers to deliver profitable on-demand care to patients at home. Uh, it was developed over two and a half years by healthcare executives, operation experts, clinicians, and MIT data scientists. It was validated by 13 customer, three major hospital system, and a major US uh, payer interviews. And we're raising 700K uh, up to a max of a million uh, for one or two pilots that we'll conduct over the 12 months. We have a market ready product and um, lots of interest from customers for engaging in one that has an MOU on their desks at the moment. At, at the moment. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of what Incasa is. And if you can bear with me, um, pin pin, I don't know if you can pin, I've, I've returned the screen to you, if you could pin my video. Uh, for the next oh slide. okay sure let me try do that there you go got it oh and then uh do i need to screen share or no yes please okay share screen i need to share you share. all right so are you on full screen now yeah but uh, if you can pull up the zoom window on your screen yes let me try to find where you are yeah, let me see. Stop sharing for a bit. Um, That's fine. I, you know, people can also do it. You can pin, uh, there's an option to pin the speaker. Um, why don't we do that? Actually, so, let me try do it again. Yeah, right. yeah please go ahead and talk. I, yeah, I'll just, I'll just sort of dive into it. So probably one of the biggest macro trends in the U.S. healthcare system today is elevating the level of medical care accessible in the home. The coronavirus pandemic has laid bare the need to deliver home-based care for non-life-threatening illnesses to control spread, deflate panic and fear, and preserve hospital beds for direst need patients and more. Unsurprisingly, there's been a surge in the number of house call care providers on the market, but they're all suffering from big non-care problems. Their unsophisticated operations means challenging economics, they lack business intelligence to improve their models, and they suffer at the whim of unpredictable demand despite the advent of AI machine learning techniques. Developed by MIT data scientists, clinicians, operation experts, and healthcare execs, Incasa's AI optimization engine provides real-time decision support, routing the optimal clinician to each patient. The engine also forecasts forward demand, determines staffing levels for all shifts, and offers a dashboard to adjust business constraints to assess impact on profitability. Our customers are house call care providers. The market is fragmented and growing rapidly. Based on a conservative 40% low to mid acuity emergency department visits, there is an annual addressable market of 65 million on-demand home visits, implying a total addressable market of about a billion dollars. And CASA eliminates about 30 to 40% or more of labor and other costs while improving performance metrics. The software suite is seemingly and non-disruptively bolted onto existing systems delivering impact in weeks, not months or years. Our team is highly seasoned. Eric is an executive at CVS and CVS is on a short list of acquirers. Carlos is a surgeon at Boston Children's and a pioneer in telehealth. Professor Georgia Parakis of MIT is a world leading expert on operations analytics and she trained Dr. Max Biggs, our chief tech officer. Michael is a global operations expert and I'm a seasoned serial healthcare entrepreneur. Therefore, Encasa sits at the intersection of what we like to think of as the right team, the right product at the right time. In the US, we offer quality care that is plagued by fundamental access and delivery flaws. 
Prior to Moncasa, I led a healthcare services company and learned firsthand how quality care access conveniently and delivered compassionately equalizes access and enjoins better outcomes at lower cost. Over decades, care delivery has shifted from major urban hubs to community care clinics. And the next step is clearly into the home. And CASA is the enabler of that fast, profitable, urgent care that can be delivered conveniently to patients at home. We hope that some of you know the need as well as we do, see the outsized impact that Encasa will have on our customers' PLs, and will join us as other members of Vector's Angel Group already have. My email is paul at encasahealthcare.com, and we hope to be in touch. Thank you very much. Perfect. They're almost exactly on time. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, sorry for the video pinning. Like, I think I can't make it happen from my Zoom screen. All right, thank you so much. Um, I just launched a poll. So up next, um, Samir, are you here? It's not gonna be Samir, it's Jeremy, the CEO and founder from Hevo. Hi, Jeremy, cool. Hi, yeah, Pin Pin. You could go ahead right. and set up the screen. I'm good, how are you? Yeah, enjoying the beautiful weather in New Mexico, cannot complain. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> and as you know, I'm gonna be doing a live demonstration, so my presentation's gonna be different than probably what other people have done here. That's exciting. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, and I guess like, I forgot to mention at the beginning that we're going to have a 10 minute break after C Light Technologies, which is two companies from now. So, so that we can have a little water restroom break. Thirty seconds left for the poll. Okay. Um all right, um, time's up for the polls, and I guess I'll hand it over to, wow, to Jeremy. That's right, thank you, Pin Pin. And it's uh, wonderful to be here with the Vectors Earth team, so thank you for joining me. I'm actually displaced because of COVID from New York, I'm in New Mexico, uh, where I'm originally from. I didn't want my mom to be alone for the pandemic, so I came back to New Mexico to make sure she wasn't. So. With that stated, let me start by saying, welcome to my mom's garage. <laughs> <laughs> and as we move forward here, uh, first thing to understand what we do, we provide electric vehicle charging, but we have a, a specialized form. We do it wirelessly. So my demo vehicle here today is the 2012 Nissan Leaf. And then over here, we have our Hevo resonant wireless charging technology. 
give a quick intro to this product. It is a UL certified product as of last week. We're proud to say that nine year journey, we have crossed that threshold, which means uh, our technology has gone through the rigors of hot and cold weather testing. It's gone through uh, chemical testing, drive over impact testing, and all the other water fire hose tests that we had to go through. Uh, the product that you see here in front of you, this is our power pad. And as you can see, it's surface mounted here in the garage, but it can be installed into the street seamless like a manhole cover. And it comes in different uh, colors and styles. There's a grid mesh on the top for anti-slippage and it meets American Disability Act requirements. So we are ADA compliant. Uh, this system uh, is connected here to our power station. Our power station, which is the white enclosure, can either be wall mounted or it can be pole mounted as you see it here. And it is connected to a 240 volt single phase 50 amp line. A washer and dryer plug is another way to say it. And that provides us with about 7.2 kilowatts of power at this location. Now this system comes complete with a gateway device that provides GPS, LTE, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, Ethernet connectivity. We have a built-in certified revenue grade energy meter. And by the way, it's not just a wireless charging system. This is a both a plug-in and a wireless charging system. Right here is a connector for a level two uh, plug-in charger. We have a holster that you can mount to this pole mount or to the wall for the plug-in charging. And that gives you the capabilities to be able to do both plug-in and wireless, but not at the same time. You get to choose one or the other. Here on the vehicle, as you can see, we've got the you know, compartment open here. It's in a lot of electric vehicles, this is a front, but in the Nissan Leaf, uh, there's actually a motor and things here. So you've got the DC charger and your AC plug-in charger. It then goes through all these cables and lines and everything through the inverter and then it converts to the 400 volt DC that most passenger and we'll say light duty vehicles uh, use in terms of its battery voltage. Our system uh, sits discreetly between this bumper and uh, this manifold. So our wireless battery adapter, and it's kind of challenging to see because it is getting a little dark here, but there's a black enclosure here and that's what connects our wireless system on the vehicle side, which is an aftermarket product today, but will be standard on vehicles soon. Uh, that's what connects to the DC charging side of the vehicle. And so we DC charge the vehicle. So in the future, we could replace a lot of this equipment, which is big, bulky, and pricey, uh, with just the standard wireless charging equipment if vehicles become wireless only in the future. I'm gonna reach below the vehicle here, and I'm showing what is our wireless vehicle pad that's mounted to the bottom of the vehicle, and that's what's used for parking and alignment over the wireless power pad here, and that's what receives the power uh, for wireless charging. So I'm actually gonna go through a quick user experience so you can see what that is like. Okay, so I'm just gonna get set up, um, share my screen. Yep, you have 45 seconds for this. Happy to do so. So a couple of uh, quick things, we manufacture in the United States. Our manufacturing is in Austin, Texas and our contract manufacturing partner is uh, Flextronics. And so as I pull up my map, you can see that there's a pin. I'm going to tap that pin and it says, okay, here's the available chargers. You've got some wireless systems. Here's Hevo DC. I'm going to tap that. And now it tells me to find this location. So as I pull forward, you're going to see that it automatically goes into parking alignment. And as I'm pulling forward, it helps me to align my vehicle and to the right location so I can wirelessly charge. And that should be coming up on your screen now. So here we are. I pull up, I'm in a good location here. All I do is turn the vehicle off. I'm 100% accurate or so, give or take. And I hit the start charging button. The thing about our equipment is that it charges as efficiently, if not more efficiently than plug-in charging. Uh, we have over 200 units in conditional purchase orders today. We do have a uh, forecast for this year for upwards of another thousand units. Uh, that we'll see in potential purchase orders. We have an open round uh, for an additional 4 million on a 20 million pre money valuation. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh,
launch the polls. We will, that's great. Um, let's see, we have uh, Renata, um, you could yeah. go ahead and set up. It's, uh, it's going to be Katya and me, so you're going to have two voices. That's, that's nice. Um, either of you can, which, which, which one of you are going to have the slides up? I have the slides. Perfect. Perfect. Can you see it now? Yep. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll wait a few minutes for the poll for Hevo and excited to hear from you. All right, we have one minute left for the poll. seconds. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, Renata and Ketcha, go. Yep. Your turn. Yep. Hi, guys. Okay. Hi, guys. Hi. So I'm Renata. And I'm Katya and we're Kif, Know Your Food. Um, KIF is a plant-based fast food alternative for kids ages 9 through 17. As we all know, our planet is facing very serious environmental problems, including the need for a big change in the way we treat our food chain. Just like the tweens and teens of this generation, KIF is committed to addressing some of these great issues. Meanwhile, Parents are also currently facing two great problems when feeding their kids, which we want to solve. Problem number one, that our kids eat healthier foods willingly. And the problem number two is that these foods are safer and more convenient. Kids can prepare and clean up after themselves. Our business model puts marketing first and our bold message of no animals here talks directly to the kids and not the parents. Currently, there are literally zero plant-based products in the market speaking to the kids in this age group, the tweens and teens. There are options for toddlers and for adults, but nothing that talks directly to this nine to 17 tech native generation. The marketing for the majority of plant-based products you find on the market is very boring, wrapped in green, broccoli-looking packaging that just turns the kids away. They don't want to eat that. Kids want to eat fun, easy foods that they know and love. 
That's why we tell them it's time to play with your food. Plant-based foods are also seen as very highbrow and expensive. KIF is named and priced as a fast food alternative to be accessible to everyone. KIF is pea protein based and frozen to oven. Our menu of items have complementary complementary nutritional values of vitamins, proteins, and fibers that incentivize kids to eat KIF multiple times per week. We're launching with meat alternative products first, nuggets, mini burgers, and mini hot dogs. A little research, um, while the US food industry grew only 2% in the last couple of years, the plant-based industry grew 30% and the meat alternative industry grew 40%. Yet, according to Nielsen, since March 15, the sales of meat alternatives is up by 270%, with an estimated 80% of those purchases made to feed kids in the household. At least 30% of that growth is expected to remain even after COVID. The sales of frozen foods is also up by more than 40%. We stand for no animals here. So all of our partners, including our co-packers, are committed to removing animal products from our food chain. And while our kids eat healthier foods, they will also learn about nutrition, animal life, and the impact that eating plant-based has on the environment through Know-It-All, an educational game that gets unlocked by unique QR codes on our fun packaging. Our business model starts with e-commerce sales and subscriptions, rolling into retail distribution in the New York tri-state area first, and then expanding countrywide and internationally. With our pilot run, we will learn from our consumers, the kids, and of course the customers, the parents, and we will adjust the final details on our product line before we start scaling to supermarkets and grocery stores. Our product development has already started with our amazing food scientist and his team, who have led one of the largest plant-based brands in the world, Gardein, for the last seven years. In three months, we will be ready to start our e-commerce sales and plan on rolling out our retail distribution phase by end of our first year. But why us? So Renata and I are entrepreneurs, marketing experts, and moms of kids ages 11 to 18 combined. We both own marketing agencies focused on experiential marketing and partnerships. One of the biggest reasons today why startups fail is that they're not able to compete with the marketing spending of large competitor brands. We will dedicate all of our agency's expertise and resources to add an estimated $700,000 in branding and sales campaign value to our pilot phase alone, and will also serve as a leverage to co-brand all retailers carrying our KIF brand and products once our retail distribution begins. Here is our advisory board. We have a killer team uh, covering all of these different areas. And here's our executive chef, Jason Stefanko. We are raising 2.3 million in seed money with 300,000 going to cover our developmental phase and another 2 million to cover our launch and scaling phase. We are super excited to hear your input as we know, you can help us to hit each of these milestones and scale our business countrywide and globally, while this industry growth has been so accelerated by this COVID pandemic. Um, please know that we're here to help you and your other brands with any marketing needs that you might have too. Welcome to KIF, time to play with your food. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Renata and Katja. That's really good two people <laughs> collaboration. Um, all right, I'll launch up the polls that seem to work well. Um, Okay, Christy, I see you're here. Um, yeah, you could set up the set up set up your slides. 
And then, yeah, so after Sea Light Technologies, we'll have a 10 minute break. Okay, we have one minute left for the poll. All right, Christy, um, yeah. Well, hi. hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Christy Sheehy. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sea Light Technologies. So everyone here on this call knows someone who suffered from neurological disease. I have an aunt who passed away from early onset Alzheimer's at the age of 60. And I have a best friend from college who got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at the age of 27. So many of us here are personally impacted and that's because roughly one sixth of our world's population will actually suffer from neurological disease in their lifetime. And even with such a huge impact globally, we still have minimal to no viable therapeutics in this space. And this really stems from the fact that therapeutic developers just don't have viable biomarkers that they can use to stratify patients as well as assess disease on a fine scale. And so they're repurposing diagnostic tools like bedside exams, which are subjective, cognitive assessments, which are time consuming, and very expensive MRIs, which have shown limited correlation with actual disease progression. And even with all of these in existence, we still face minimal to no solutions. So Sea Light has a solution that involves the most non-invasive way to assess the brain, and that's through the eye. Our patented hardware software combo starts out very simply by placing your chin onto a chin rest and staring straight ahead. We then record the very back of your eye, which is also the front of your brain. And we extract eye motion from these high resolution cellular images about a thousand times per second. And we feed that eye motion data into our feature-based neural network that now allows us to begin to delineate different visual signatures depending on the stage of disease progression as well as the type of disease assessed. And so this approach has numerous advantages. First, it's super fast. It's a 10 second scan each time and it's very repeatable. We have only a 5% variance. And compared to other visual or video based eye trackers out there on the market, we're about 120 times more sensitive in the information that we can pick up, ultimately bringing the invisible to light. 
Additionally, we've been 225% higher correlation values with disease progression for multiple sclerosis than current MRI metrics. And so we've partnered with top tier research institutions to validate our approach, starting off with UCSF and multiple sclerosis, and also having an open pilot there now for Alzheimer's. Additionally, we just finished our concussion recovery pilot at the University of Pittsburgh. And these additional indications allow us to de-risk that future market potential. And so our go-to market really is looking at the MS population first. So using a bottoms up approach, this is a $1 billion opportunity. When we add in our pipeline now, which is concussion and Alzheimer's, this is 10 billion. And if every person that walked into a neurologist's office had their eyes scanned, this is a $35 billion opportunity. And so for our market, we really have a pharma first approach, starting off with a paid pilot for an exploratory endpoint. And then upon FDA approval, we could transition that into a partnership. And this early interaction with pharma really help, will really help to drive future clinical adoption, starting off with MS specialty and then expanding on into the general neurology group. We already have eight LOIs for purchase from clinician customers and one LOI for an exploratory endpoint from a pharmaceutical company. And so in order to be successful in our landscape, you need to be fast, and inexpensive. But additionally, you need to be objective and non-invasive because the true unmet need is the fine disease progression mapping. And that's where all of these technologies fail to meet. Our traction to date is 108,000 in revenue, top partnerships, an LOI with pharma, and our letters of intent. We have IP surrounding the core tech as well as supporting patents that are for the furthering the device, as well as our method of assessing neurological health. And I have the privilege of working with an amazing set of individuals. We are the dream team of the optical engineer, the neuroscientist, the business guy that can speak neuroscience, and the data scientist. And we're supported by an amazing group of advisors. They have taken devices from bench to bedside all the way through strategic exits at Leica and Alcon. So to date, we've been extremely successful in non-dilutive funding, as well as additional Skydeck Accelerator and Angel Money to meet our proof of concept, reimbursement validation, and regulatory strategy. And what we're raising now is 3.5 million on a 13 million post money valuation. We have our lead term sheet already in place from Creative Ventures, and we're looking for strategic follow-on capital to execute on these four goals. And that's it. We're Sea Light Technologies and we're Neurological Health in the blink of an eye. Cool, perfect. Um, all right. We'll start the polls. Let's see. All right. And I think. Uh, Jacob, so basically, like we'll have three minutes, Paul, and then we'll have like, a 10 minute break. And so, like, feel free to set it, set things up now, or otherwise, like, you could um, wait for during the break to set your screens up.
All right. Um, okay, um, we, time's up for the poll. Um, we'll have a short 10 minute break. Uh, so now it's like 8.26, so we'll reconvene at, not 8, I mean, um, 6 p.m. 26, so we'll reconvene at about like 6.30. Five or thirty six. So um, in case anyone is interested, I have this very funny link um, that allows coffee break that be more fun. It's like a, a stimulation of a real meeting room and people can talk simultaneously at the same time communicating um, if, if anyone wants to try. Yeah, I mean, feel free to show us. <laughs> yeah, I already uh, pasted the link in the chat room. Okay. Just, uh, well, well, one thing is that you will have to use a Zoom, uh, no, sorry, Chrome, Chrome uh, browser to uh, click the link and then you will be uh, seeing the room and then you can choose a spot to sit on to chat with people there if you want to try this out. I'm, I'm I'm at the room right now. Oh, I see. Yeah, so so this is also yeah very fun. Like my really new discover, and I fall in love with it immediately. And then you will see your little like uh, head there, and then you can click on yourself, and then you will see the different space in the sofa. Well, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to milk myself here in the Zoom, but we can talk there. <laughs>
Okay, okay, we, we are back. Um, all right. Uh, hi everyone, um, welcome back. All right, uh, next we have, this is our second half of Victorious Angels deal meeting. Uh, we have another seven companies. Uh, just a reminder of our pitch format, we'll have five minutes of pitch uh, and then another three minutes for investors to fill out our the polls and Okay, I'll hand it off to Jacob from Flywire. All right, great. Is uh, I'm a screen sharing okay? Uh, you can hear me okay, Pin Pin? Yep, it's perfect. 
Perfect, great. Uh, so my name is Jacob Isaac Lowry. I'm the CEO of Flywire. Um, and at Flywire, we're focused on seafood. So it's one of the most valuable traded commodities on the planet. And it's a critical piece of the global food system. So it's a real big problem right now that the wild capture sector is still struggling to ensure the long-term health of critical fish stocks in an economical way. And the reason this problem exists is because the data that you need to effectively manage these critical food resources is simply cost prohibitive at the needed scale, which is a real problem for the seafood industry because unsustainable fisheries produce less fish and they also struggle to sell into the best supply chains, which pay the best price. That's why our industry cares about this. And right now, we have a unique opportunity uh, to address this pain point by fundamentally modernizing the way that seafood is commercially fished. So the basic problem we're solving is that right now, no one really knows what happens out on the water every time fishing boats leave the dock. And for a commercial vessel, fishing vessel operator, running their business without actually knowing what happens when their boats are at sea is a lot like a plant manager trying to run a factory without ever being able to see inside. It's inefficient. So we built the world's first Fitbit for fishing boats to give our customers the tools they need to boost profitability by bringing their operational efficiency in line with comparable industries. At the same time, the analytics we generate are also used to meet regulator requirements and underpin key product certifications needed to ensure the long-term viability of the food supply. So we're helping an old industry become more efficient through technology while also making better regulation possible through transparency. Now the root of this problem is that data capture in fisheries has always been an expensive cost of compliance. But with Flywire, for the first time, our customers can now turn it into a new profit center. And this is real dollars and cents value that McKinsey and the World Bank have estimated could save 11 billion in annual operating efficiencies, as well as activate an additional 80 billion in annual harvest value. That's about a 50% increase over current harvest levels today. And it's a big part of why the market for vessel level data capture in seafood is projected to grow by about 25X over the next 10 years. Now for our product, we install our hardware on vessel, and then we collect data on catch, handling, efficiency, and vessel performance using video, GPS, and other sensors. When the boat returns, data is uploaded to the cloud. We use AI to help process, and then we generate reporting for all stakeholders. This includes ops or catch accounting reporting for regulatory compliance and certification, ops insights to track and improve key profitability metrics, and predictive analytics on where and when to fish. You add it all up and we're talking about changing the way that fishing is done. We're driving new efficiencies in fuel, labor, and product quality for fishermen while verifying sustainability for retailers and regulators. Our business model is straightforward. So we've got an upfront fee or lease model for hardware and installation, and then a back-end recurring fee for data analysis and reporting. Our price point is about 10 to 15K per year for the average commercial vessel here in the US, and we project about a 12 month payback period. Now in terms of customer recruitment, we also don't need to go chase every boat. So for our customers, we're initially targeting fisher, associate, fisher associations or buyers that are sourcing from large fleets of vessels that have acute compliance or certification needs right now. In our market, this particular customer archetype is very sticky with a large lifetime value. And then we recruit these customers onto annually recurring contracts for vessels. And with the business model breakthrough that we developed through Techstars and the Elemental Accelerator, unit of economics that work for a single boat, we've already been able to land our first big corporate. It's Pacific Seafood. They're a multi-billion dollar US seafood company, vertically integrated, sourcing from a fleet of over 800 vessels. And this has been a critical milestone in our work to create and dominate our $40 billion category. Now, in terms of competition, the primary competition still remains paying an outside person to go on every boat and fill out data sheets, which is obviously not effective, especially during COVID. Now our secondary competition is the six other companies around the world producing a similar product. However, these systems are basically a CCTV security system installed up in the rigging with a few other sensors to collect what they can. They're designed with the government as the customer 
and the product market fit is so bad that governments and NGOs have to pay people to use them. In contrast, we're the only ones with an engineered solution that's IP protected that integrates directly into the underlying fishing activity. So we get better quality data with minimal impact to the cruise efficiency at less cost. As founders, Sarah and I have known each other for about 20 years. So she's a marine scientist. She's worked for NOAA, uh, the government top NGO. She's got a background in protected species work. I'm an engineer trained by Toyota and lean manufacturing, you know, previously run product development for another startup through to acquisition. Uh, our key and our key business and industry advisors are also effective and engaged. And right now we're raising a $1 million seed round at this time to scale up as we already have more than enough boats in play today, then we need to hit our out year revenue targets. And so with that, happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Jacob. Um, uh, Turn on the polls. Let's see, fly wire cameras. All right. Cool. And next up, we have uh, Adam. If you want to set up the screen share, where's that? All right. Only, okay, only six people voted. Um. All right, 30 seconds left for flywire poll. All right, um, Adam. All right, well, thanks for uh, having us. I'm Adam with Axel Medical, powering the world's connected medical devices. I used to run the Verily Life Sciences Medical Device Software Group um, since the early days as a Google X uh, moonshot project. It's the most advanced group medical devices. Uh, we worked with great partners who build amazing hardware and really struggled with the software components. And these are huge partnerships. So for smaller companies, getting software and a medical device right is a huge thing. 
they all had to time elsewhere. Uh, in our apps, the hardware or the kind of funny case that they're working in. When they build something that's not real house, it's a plus market, increased cyber security and regulatory risk, and there's usually a risk benefit. It's all game companies. Diverting resources away from what we're at. They're reinventing the wheel by building a custom solution that's almost identical to every other custom solution. Real opportunity for and there are few to do this today, but there was, there's going to be thousands more of these types of devices coming to market. So far, this is being driven forward by chronic care for diabetes, uh, CGMs, and these type of things that are devices that you can buy today that are connected and secure. Um, reimbursement codes that have been shifting to provide new ways to get reimbursed for devices outside of the hospital, especially as uh, coronavirus is continuing. And in the future, we'll see data-driven care and outcome-based treatment as norms in the healthcare industry. So when new devices come to market, connectivity will be seen as table stakes for all of these new devices. But it's really hard to get. Our solution is connectivity as a service. You build the hardware, we build the software that makes it connected. We handle the infrastructure that every device needs and shouldn't have to create from scratch. This completely replaces one of the components that every connected device maker has to build. Our approach scales really well across multiple manufacturers. This is the market size and this is the United States alone. That middle number, the $3.7 billion, is, a, is the opportunity for the market. It's heavily fragmented. There are tons of different verticals in, in the medical device space, but the entire industry is ripe for modernization. And these numbers are going to keep growing rapidly for the next decade. The, the way we project our financials shows $100 million in an obtainable market for, uh, for our business in Europe. So our product for customers is extremely sticky. And I think that's the really the, the most significant takeaway here. Changing this component post-launch requires an FDA submission, which no one really wants to do. We have 80% gross margins at scale. And the way we're able to do this is that we have to be exceptionally good at isolating reusable components from single-use components. This is actually really hard to do properly and even harder in the medical world. It comes from experience in medical systems design. Very few people can do this properly. Our go-to-market is for is building for devices that are at home uh, devices in chronic care. So the need for connectivity is there. It's irreplaceable. These devices don't work without the connectivity, but their data needs are simple and homogenous. Uh, they don't do video, they don't do images. And so it's really, uh, really easy to reuse the same infrastructure. Our solution is low complexity, but absolutely essential for them. From here, we add new verticals by adding new functionality piece by piece. We have two LOIs representing a projected 20K MRR, and our product is partially built. We have a prototype that's well on its way to the desired functionality. After this go-to-market, our eventual expansion is to connect with EHRs and with hospitals, creating a sort of marketplace effect where more devices mean more providers are on board and more providers mean more devices need to integrate with us. Supporting telemedicine appointments, reimbursement flows. These are the types of things that, where this data will be most useful and eventually supporting a full suite of tools for providers and payers, becoming the go-to service for understanding patient care outside the hospital. So the way it's done today, the current state of the art is pretty lousy. You can build it yourself. The one kind of degree of flexibility you have is you can hire a consultant that will help a little bit. They'll, they'll uh, give you advice, but they won't build it for you. We have two direct competitors that we track pretty closely compared to them. Our module works at a higher level of abstraction, so you need less expertise to be able to integrate it. And we don't want to own your custom stuff. That's not uh, what our system is all about. And uh, as well as that, we have um, a few provisional patents that are ready to file. We have an amazing team. Um, I'm an expert in medical device systems and in cybersecurity. Carrie is our expert in market strategy. And we have advisors whom we love. Um, we just added one, actually, there's three, uh, covering our sort of regulatory angle, EHRs, uh, and we're very excited about these guys. Today, we're raising 500K as a pre-seed investment. Um, and our, these will help us hit our milestones of launching three customers and 360K ARR. So join us and accelerate the connected health revolution. All right, perfect. Um, thanks a lot. Let's see, I'll start up the poll. And if anybody have questions, um, please feel free to send it in the chat. Uh, all right. 
Mm, let's see. Uh, Elena, you could go ahead and set up if Sounds you good. All right, we have 30 seconds left for the poll. All right, time's up for the poll for Axel Medical. Now, Elena, now it's your turn. <laughs> sure, can you see my screen okay? Yep, perfect. Okay. All right, hi everyone. My name is Elena and I'm the co-founder of Rubbish. And a little while ago, my dog ate a piece of litter while on a daily walk. He was fine, but I got so angry. I started to research litter and how do cities manage this problem and mitigate it? And what could I do about it beyond not littering? I found no solution, no data to drive decisions, and no transparency into what was actually being done on the ground to solve the problem. We've been cleaning the same way for decades, and I started Rubbish to change that. What is the problem here? Cities are overwhelmed by the amount of litter they need to pick up. Litter exists for a couple of reasons. It could be a lack of infrastructure, a lack of caring, or a lack of resources to fix it. City spending year over year continues to go up, but urban spaces continue to remain dirty. Regular citizens tend to be the most affected by this, people who just walk around their local neighborhoods every single day. Networks like Next Door have actually become an outlet for a lot of complaining, but a little or, or no action. Engaged citizens who love their communities are actually an untapped resource to litter problems, and there's no clear motivation for the average person to actually clean. Rubbish came up with a way to engage everybody in the community toward a shared common goal. Our approach is a cleanup marketplace for litter. We combine software and hardware that make litter, cleaning up litter fun and it records personal progress. Engaged residents or rubbishers as we call them are incentivized to submit issues to clean up and to turn their litter points into local rewards. Rubbish takes a percentage of each transaction that flows through our platform. 
some, um, this slide covers six months of our milestones, but I'll just want to highlight a couple. At the start of this year, our first investor came on board. Shortly after, uh, we launched the first part of our cleanup marketplace at a conference in Silicon Valley. The planning commissioner of Redwood City actually called it the cleanest event that he's ever seen. And we contracted a few more events for our platform, but COVID hit in March and those disappeared. Instead, we shifted gears and we secured a contract while sheltering in place with the largest business improvement district in San Francisco. This was our first SaaS contract and validated yet another revenue stream for Rubbish. Over the next two months, we backordered our smart litter picker upper and spoke with Keep America Beautiful and Adopt a Highway to put beams into their hands. Contracts that are worth well over $1.1 million. A month ago, we started streaming our cleanups on Reddit and 100,000 people every single week tune in to see us pick up litter and talk about our project. We see traction growing very quickly. So the question now is why now, why rubbish? The world as it stands now has everyone in their homes and local communities more than ever before. Noticing digital environments and are longing to both get out of the house and to make a positive impact. The combination of software, hardware, and brand really resonates with everyone. Moreover, the data that we collect through our rubbish beam, our smart picker upper, is a part of our long-term plan to use that information to drive decisions for cities, which is another revenue stream. Our approach takes into consideration a couple of problems, including cleaning up, supporting local businesses, and gathering information for future planning. This landscape is quite interesting. Oops, sorry. This landscape is, um, is interesting, and we're unique in our approach because these, there are other companies in the landscape that have already validated the market. Of note are a couple of acquisitions like TaskRabbit by IKEA and the walkability score by Redfin. So investing in clean and healthy communities, as Vector Angels knows, is a great investment where you can not only have a great ROI, but also feel great about the impact that you're making within the local environment. Some projections. So you'll see three streams here that cover each of our revenue streams from hardware to data services and SaaS through to our cleanup marketplace. Um, for this year, we have one business improvement district committed and on board and two others with proposals that we're hoping to sign in the next month. Um, our beam for um, crowdfunding, uh, we're doing a crowdfunding campaign in Q4 and beam sales over that will come through um, that quarter. We're aiming to be profitable within the next four years. So markets beyond litter. We see corporations as a big opportunity for us to fulfill corporate social responsibility goals and volunteer time off packages that are currently being underutilized by employees who just are not motivated to do that. Long term, we see the billion dollar idea in the value of the data that we're collecting. We wanna use the information to identify smarter cleaning strategies and create a block by block litter index of streets worldwide. Our team is pretty fantastic. My partners and I have all known each other for quite some time and we stem from various backgrounds. Um, our Eamon is a uh, software developer and has been in technology for, for the last 15 years. And Felipe has worked for DARPA in uh, drone technology and comes from mechanical engineering. Our goal for this pre-seed round is to raise 850,000 for the next 12 months to get us to 1 million in um, annual recurring revenue. That will help us grow our team. And most importantly, build our Android app to attract new users and get our beam into mass scale production. We've already identified a partner to help us do that. Thank you so much. And uh, please chat if you have any questions. Thanks, Elena. Um, yeah. All right, I'll shoot up the poll. Launch poll. Perfect. Um, next up, uh, Caitlin. All right, you could go ahead and set up. She around.
All right, we have one minute left for the poll. There's only nine of us who filled up the polls. All right, 15 seconds. All right, um, I guess, uh, Caitlin, you could go ahead and start. Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. And the screen is perfect too. Okay, wonderful. So my name is Caitlin Christine, and I am the CEO and founder of Gabby. Oh, there go. 90% of women don't know their own health risks. And I know this because my mom was one of those women. She died of breast cancer due to malpractice. And shortly after she passed at 22 years old, I exhibited similar symptoms, but had to fight to even get physicians to pay attention to me. They kept saying that I was too young and there was no possible way I could have breast cancer. I eventually chose to have a preventable double mastectomy at age 24 and in surgery, they diagnosed me with breast cancer. I then went into healthcare working as a national patient speaker for a nonprofit that focused on early detection and prevention and eventually became a hereditary cancer specialist working for the largest genetic testing company in the world. It's there that my personal experience informed my professional experience that women don't know what's going on with their breasts and their vaginas. I had the opportunity to be in the 10% of those women. And that's what Gabby is about. We're empowering women to understand their own health and proactively seek the care that they need. Our software helps payers engage and monitor their members to deliver maximum cost savings. We see that there's a problem both with women and in the payers market. Because women don't know what's going on with their bodies, it leads to delayed diagnosis and an increase in disease incidence. On the, same, on the other side, the payers are losing billions of dollars annually because their patients are not receiving the necessary preventative services. And those numbers have only gone up during COVID. This leads to diseases being diagnosed at later stages, wasting valuable dollars. We see ourselves as a win-win for both sides of the coin. For women, our health assessments help women understand their bodies with our clinically validated assessments that provide actionable insights to empower women to take control of their health. And for the payers, the software ensures maximum savings by increasing the rate of women who receive necessary preventative services. Our TAM is 974 billion. We see our serviceable market as 307 billion, but we're only going after 2% of that number. That is the seven, or excuse me, the 38 million women who are insured. We've had some awesome traction to date. With our initial assessment being released, we had 234 women complete it and found out that 90% of them were not adequately being managed for their breast care. This increased revenue for our health system over $600,000 and equated in $11.8 million of cost savings for the payer. This case study led to our first customer, which we are launching in less than two weeks. This customer is so excited about our partnership that not only are they paying us for our services, but they're allocating additional resources to create this as a pillar for their community. Our business model is a pay per member per month model 
that the payers are very um, familiar with. And for the payers, what it looks like is once they identify their patient population they want to target, a one-click sign-up is sent to the patients using omni-channel communication. At that point, it's just up for the patient to begin engaging with Gabby. And once they start following their interactive roadmap, the quality metrics improve and cost savings is returned. For women, once they receive the link, they're able to assess their risk, learn their lifetime risk of breast cancer, engage and connect with other women, and they're navigated through the health system, decreasing the risk of disease. We have a few competitors, but no one's doing it exactly the way we are. Lavongo, which was just acquired last week for 19 billion. And as you can see, one of our key differentiators is the fact that we are women's health exclusively. The other fact is that it only takes one. And what I mean is that we only need one member to engage with Gabby and have a preventative experience that will 10X the payer's cost savings. We have a super strong team, as well as a very strong team of advisors, and we are raising 1 million pre-seed. All right, thanks, Caitlin. Um, start the polls. That's very interesting. All right, I think we have a question for you too in the chat. All right, um, next up would be uh, Tom. Let's see. Yeah, Tom, you could set up the slides during this time if you're ready. We have one minute left for the poll. Um, we have eight people filled in. Thirty seconds left. All right. Hi, Tom. Maybe. Uh, can you hear and see the charts? Yep, perfectly. All right. Perfect. I'm ready to roll. Great. Uh, thank you for uh, meeting, with, meeting with me this evening. My name is Tom Stone, and I'm the CEO of SensoryGen. 
Sensorygen uses computational biology to discover natural compounds to replace harsh or toxic chemicals in everyday products. We then patent those natural compounds for specific uses and then license them to large companies to take our ingredients or products to market. So we are a licensing and a royalty play uh, company. Our natural compound discovery platform was developed at the University of California by Dr. Anand Ray in his lab using more than $2 million of funding, primarily from the National Institutes of Health, but also from several private foundations that are listed here. Um, a number of technical papers have been written on this uh, discovery platform and the way it works, and uh, they've been published, and we can provide those to you. Our team consists of myself. I have an engineering background, an MBA from UCLA, and uh, SensoryGen is my fourth startup. Uh, Dr. Anand Ray, as I mentioned, is a professor at UC Riverside uh, who invented the technology, um, and he is a well, well known and well respected uh, uh, academic in these areas, and has been awarded many, uh, many, many citations. Uh, Mark Lauer worked for me at one of my previous startups, and he leads our business development team. And primarily, what he does is helps us to. Uh, access and work with some of the large companies that we have been working with. I'll talk about that in a minute. How our discovery platform works is we take known actives, for instance, uh, a mosquito repellent, for instance, that is known to repel insects like uh, DEET or Picardin, and we model them in 3D molecular space. And we find the common uh, molecular structures between those different repellent compounds and, and, and basically characterize part of the molecule that is acting as the repellent piece that docks with the nerve uh, or the, uh, the, the receptor um, that causes the mosquito to, to think that it's something smells bad and to be repelled. Once we have that modeled, we can then compare that molecular structure to our database of more than 500,000 natural compounds to find similar structures and then rank them based on effect uh, predicted efficacy. We then take those results, refine them further based on efficacy, predicted toxicity, cost, commercial availability, smell, scent, feel, um, and then we go into testing. Typically, we'll start with 50 to 100 compounds and actually start doing real testing in the lab to select to narrow, start narrowing down our funnel to select the best compound. In parallel with this, we're usually out talking with uh, other large companies that could use this ingredient or this product. Uh, and so that they could take it to market. So the goal is to find a compound that's uh, unique to a uh, retailer and then have them sign a licensing agreement and take it to market. We've applied this technology in insect repellents, human taste, natural insecticides, nutraceuticals, and human scent. Um, our current customer pipeline looks like this. Down the left, we have a number of products that are in development along the, the, the x-axis, we have the process by which we go through to go from introductions to a company to getting to a fully signed license that's generating some revenue. Um, typically, there's an R&D phase where we're doing compound discovery. Then there's a contract phase, funding where the uh, company uh, may, may provide some, uh, some non-recurring funding or discovery funding. And then ultimately, we sign a license for them to take that product to market. Starting at the top of the left, we have a topical mosquito repellent that is based on an all natural compound that was discovered in Dr. Ray's lab that is now being licensed to a company called Congo. Congo was uh, founded by the founders of Cremo. Cremo is a personal uh, men's personal products company that just sold uh, last week uh, for $235 million. They're, the founders of Cremo plan to do the same thing to Congo, with Congo, launch it to the market build it to about $100 million in sales, and then, uh, and then, and, and, and then be ready for a sale. Um, we are licensing agreement with Congo calls for $200,000 in upfront payments to us this year. Um, we expect to get through EPA registration by next year, um, and then we'll launch to market next year. And then we receive 7.5% royalty payments from all of Congo sales. And we have minimum royalties that they have to meet. Starting in 2022, they have to meet a minimum royalty of 770,000, which equates to about $10 million of retail sales on their end. Um, and that grows year to year. So out in 2030, they have to meet a minimum of $10.8 million of royalties to us, which equates to almost $50 million in sales. 
Um, we have an agriculture insect repellent that's licensed to a company called Locus Agriculture. Um, that product, that compound is going through EPA registration. Uh, we, have a, we have a spatial mosquito repellent. That's a product that you plug into the wall. It's kind of like a, uh, 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 a room uh, odorant. Um, and only the, the scent will repel mosquitoes from a room. And we also have a natural insecticide. We're developing both of those products in a partnership with Procter & Gamble. Um, we'll finish those development projects later this year and then hopefully negotiate a license with them by the end of the year. Uh, we're working on a sweet enhancer project with Coca-Cola. Uh, aspartame, stevia, etc., are all sugar replacements. This is a sugar sweet enhancer, so it makes sugar taste sweeter. The idea is that you could then put 50% sugar into a drink instead of 100% sugar, but it would taste just like sugar because it is sugar. Um, some uh, synthetic compounds have been developed that do this, that have this characteristic uh, and this property, um, but neither Coca-Cola nor Pepsi nor any of the drink companies will put them into, their, into the drinks because it's another synthetic, nasty kind of a compound and people don't want that. Coca-Cola came to us and asked us to find a natural replacement for these synthetic compounds. We did a $250,000 research project with them. We identified two classes of compounds, patented them, and we're now ready to do uh, human taste testing. Um, and then at, if that is successful, then we'll be ready to go back to Coca-Cola and negotiate a license. We're expanding into other uh, uh, agriculture products in, like almonds and grapes and in livestock. Um, our competition is primarily the internal uh, uh, R&D teams at large companies. We have a strong IP barrier. We have 20 patents in these areas. 16 are licensed from UCR, four are generated from sensory gen, and those four are in, the, uh, in these, uh, the 20 are across these uh, uh, market segments that I talked about earlier. We're raising 1.5 million in equity financing, 4, 4 million pre-money valuation. We're doing three closings. The initial closing was in May. We closed 300K. We have 700K fully committed and ready to close this month. And we have 500K that we're remaining. We have about 150,000 of that 500 committed. And so we're looking for investors to, uh, to round out the rest of the funding. Um, I, the funding, all this funding will be used, about 76% of it will go to product development, 12% to salaries, 7% for uh, patents, and 5% to overhead. Um, and I'd be glad to answer any questions in the chat bar. All right, perfect. Um, thanks, Tom. I'll open up the polls. See, and in the meantime, uh, I think it's going to be Nabru, right? Yep. Um, Sergio, or are you pitching or? Yeah. Let me just share the screen. Share the screen. Yep. Yeah. Um. All right, Marcin, cool. Yeah, I'm doing it instead of Sergio. He's still present on the conversation here, but um, I'm going to run the presentation. Um, yeah, uh, I think we can wait a few minutes for the poll and then we could get started. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course.
All right, there's one minute left for the poll. All right, yeah, Marcin. Um, uh, so hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Marcin. I'm the CEO of Nabru, and I'm here with uh, Sergio, our CTO. He's somewhere else in the, in the group. And um, uh, we help city planners and designers quickly transform urban streetscapes into more accessible, friendly, and sustainable public realms. We do it all with a single responsive modular system. So basically there's five of us in the team. Currently Sergio and myself are involved uh, full time, whereas the, the rest embark on a part-time basis. So Sergio and Nico, they work on urban mobility and transportation projects in the past, uh, which is what we do in Nabru right now. Uh, here we are looking at Sergio, who in the past represented now our main competitor helping the departments of transportation coordinate installation of the traffic calming solutions. So during that time, he learned firsthand about all the unaddressed problems uh, regarding the products and, and traffic safety. But let's take a step back a little uh, and see the actual program, which is uh, that the traditional construction methods are too slow to face the ever-changing needs of the populations living in the cities. So we can't wait years for streets to actualize and accommodate, for example, new modes of transport. Uh, the global population is growing and we need our cities to be more updatable. So what's really controlling a safe and fair distribution of space within urban infrastructure? Bear in mind that we can't just grab and move buildings around. It is mainly markings, like I refer to road markings and a pavement design. And so here we are looking at the schematic example of an absolutely dysfunctional section of road in New York. There's not much focus on walkability, cycling infrastructure is not present at all, and everything is being slowed down by buses having to change lane to pull to and away from the curb. If we aspire to fix it using traditional methods, we'll have to involve excavation, any mistake would not be easily reversible and you couldn't upgrade it afterwards if necessary. And because of the former too, we would often face massive bureaucratic hurdles. So for instance, to get a permission for a simple curb extension in the center of New York, it may take you even 10 years of, of, of the paperwork. So what we have developed here in Nabru to mitigate all these problems is the modular system. It is a road surface mounted solution. It is made from 100% recycled PVC and it will be recyclable after, after its end life as well. Uh, we want to take waste produced by the cities and convert it into something that can serve those very cities. <clears throat> Module system can be configured to build pretty much any structure that traditionally would be delivered for paving work. Take a look at how it could transform this setting with so much care for the local communities and in less than a week's time. And then we would see the landscape morphing according to the necessities for the next 20 years of its service life. Here are some of the points that will make our client choose us over the competition. All of these were inspired by numerous conversations we had and are still having with some of the DOT representatives. It feels like we've designed the product with them, with our end client. So it's not just that we suppose it would be nice to have this feature or that feature is something that we know it's necessarily and, and current products are lacking. Um, so features like leveling system and improved impact resistance, effortless cleaning of debris accumulated by flow of rainwater, 
we are trying to produce the system in the US and currently nobody does that. So department, all departments of transportation that use pop-up solutions like that, they import it from Europe, uh, which, which is on its own a great thing because uh, governments will be able to contribute to the local economies. Uh, we have a digital platform, which is a mean of communication between us and the clients. You can see the past projects, current projects, and have an overall look on 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 progress and and what's going on, which is something that was also missing in in Sergio's experience with DOTs. Uh, here we are looking at the top three competitors. Uh, the the top two. Uh, operate only within the UK and Zikla is the one where Sergio worked in the past. Um, they expanded to other countries in, including US and the revenue you see under Zikla is just for the operation for that time in the US. Uh, so we forecast eight plus million in revenue for the first year considering the accelerating popularity of such solutions current uh, figures of our competitors and events such as COVID and other ongoing city projects. Uh, so the production cost is $19.5 and we will sell each module for $130. Uh, we set a goal of um, providing nearly 300,000 pieces for the market in the next three years that would equate to nearly $40 million in revenue. We are in the process of partnering up with Knology, which is IoT technology oriented company. They would like to install sensors in our pieces to collect data from the cities. And the second company is AMG, who is directly connected with Contra Costa Transportation Authority, which if you guys from San Francisco, you, you, you may be aware of. Uh, and we, are we were already invited to present the project to the director of Contra Costa that also sees an opportunity to use our system not only in the cities but at the test bay for autonomous vehicles in San Francisco. Um, they, the company is connected with uh, all 50 states and the departments of transportation there including Canada and they would like to help us distribute the product. Um, I'm going to jump that one for the sake of time. So what we are looking for is 300,000 in exchange for 30% of company equity. And that would be to fund mainly long-term assets such as manufacturing tools, setting the company operations in the US, uh, some legal expenses and budget for a small to medium starting project. Uh, thank you very much for your attention guys and I hope I didn't exceed the time too much. Thank you. Hello. Hello, I muted myself. Okay. Um, thanks, Marcin. Okay. Um, I'll launch up the you. poll. And let's see. Last up, we have Will from Fitpack. Hello um, there. Hi. Uh, yep. Um, sorry, we're a little bit over time, but okay. yeah, please feel free to set up. see my screen okay Pimpin? Yep that's perfect it's beautiful. Fantastic.
All right, we have one minute left for the poll. All right, Will, fire away. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Pimpin, and thank you, Vector's Angel, for inviting me today. Um, and good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's managed to navigate well during this period. I know it's been very challenging for us all. I'm talking about this period. Um, it's something that I'm deeply passionate about, and I've been passionate about it since graduating from the University of Michigan in 2015, is human health optimization. I became laboriously engaged with this topic. And through personal testing and research and analysis, I found that to achieve health and well-being, lasting health and well-being, it takes a, pre a plethora of uh, incremental variables that have to be inputted in order to get on track and stay on track. So my team and I at Fitpack, we are dedicated to people and we are people centric. When you dive deeper into what's happening now with COVID and looking at what you know, global governments and institutions are reporting on, we're seeing that a lot of these issues and people are dying as a result of morbidities. And these morbidities and these conditions are caused by preventative you know, lifestyle factors, essentially. And these are the issues that we want to solve. You know, we want to address directly these health issues like type 2 diabetes, like nutritional deficiency, like heart conditions or respiratory conditions through lifestyle changes. If you dig a bit deeper into the granularity of the issues, we can see that nutritional deficiency costs society a lot of money, 3.5 trillion per year exactly, and that comes from uh, the World Health Organization. 17.9 million deaths from heart disease each year, which totals 31% of deaths worldwide. And by 2030, and this is a report by the International Diabetes Federation, a report suggests that in 2030, 578 million people are going to be living with type two by diabetes. Now with someone like myself who is people centric, this for me is an issue and it's more than an issue actually, it is a mission, it's a mission for us. Before we created a product, before we had Fitpack, the health management tool, we did a series of testing and we surrounded ourselves with experts in PhDs of sports science, performance nutrition, clinical nutrition, performance nutrition. And we built a, a syndicate, so to speak, to understand the you know, the, the key pillars to long-term health and well-being optimization. And we found that the four main pillars after doing our due diligence were as follows. Plant-based nutrition. Now, no, this doesn't talk about going vegan. What this talks about is eating more fruits and vegetables, consuming more plant-based nutrients, therefore increasing vitamin Cs, therefore decreasing inflammation, etc. Physical activity. So not going to the gym and beasting and doing loads of weight, but moving the body depending on if you're young, if you're old, moving your body, your body in the way that serves you. Mindfulness, so manipulating and controlling stress hormone release, you know, cortisol being the, the big uh, killer, so to speak. But ultimately, it's all about a positive habit formation and ultimately doing a behavior a series of times so that it becomes ingrained in the feedback system of the brain to then move forward um, to sustainable success. Now let's talk about the Fitpack app MVP because we are at an early stage. I raised the angel round of funding in 2019, November, and it enabled us to get the MVP on the app stores, Google Play and um, iOS. And what we did with the MVP is we onboarded 4,000 users from around the world um, across six different continents. And the goal really was to get some data insights and to have people using our diet and exercise platform in order to understand what are the short term, what are the medium term, what are the long term effects of Fitpack? Because ultimately we want to address some serious health issues. Now, as a result of feedback, we found that people on our platform decreased weight if they wanted to lose weight, increased their energy, 
We even helped to use a, uh, totally eradicate her IBS, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, which uh, affects a multiplicity of people around the world. We helped her re reverse her IBS. And also we helped to use her stop smoking after seven years. So through our system, we've helped people not only, you know, get the incremental energy increases, which helps our productivity, generally our mood, et cetera, but we've helped an individual reverse IBS and stop smoking after seven years. So we have a spectrum of health benefits that we are essentially leading with our value propositions. Now let's talk business model. Now our initial go-to-market strategy is to lead with a corporate product that is led with the B2B SaaS model. So how this works essentially is we'll work with heads of HR, heads of people uh, or culture to be their health partner extension essentially. After speaking with a plethora of HR executives and VPs, it seems like now they're being tasked with making sure that people are well and healthy inside the office and now with COVID outside the office as well. So we're finding that heads of people and heads of HR are having a tremendously difficult problem to solve with how to keep our culture um, and morale high, but at the same time, increase revenues and top and bottom line metrics, meet KPIs, but ultimately look after their people for retention, to reduce sickness days, et cetera. To add, um, we've just started our pipeline. I'll be very transparent. I'm in communications now with three companies that are looking to do a pilot study. So the idea is to do a pilot program with three companies essentially in, in, in the initial phases, um, whilst we raise investment to develop V2.0 of the platform. As we start as well, um, we have almost partnered with a clinical firm with, called the CIC, and the CIC are ran by the CEO, Michael Miller, is sat on the World Health Organization board. So we already have affiliations with World Health Organization. I personally have connections with Public Health England as they're looking for solutions now with the whole NHS campaign of losing weight and increasing mobili uh, mobility and flexibility. So we have great pipeline in terms of corporations, clinical institutions, but ultimately the goal for us is to make um, headway in governmental change and reform because there are significant increases in healthcare costs at the moment and uh, governments are outlandishly saying they need to address these. So ultimately the long-term vision is to work with governmental agencies as well as clinical institutions, um, but corporations are going to be our initial business model um, at a per, per user per month build annually subscription model. So let's talk more about the team obviously myself as being CEO. James is a CTO of the company. He's a tech cleaner of one of the largest, fastest growing tech companies. Sergio Giannone uh, has just resigned from Coca-Cola. He works as one of their leading branding and product specialists. And he's essentially going to be moving across to the UK to continue full-time operations with me. And we are being held and guided by credible and established CFO, Tanmay Carr, who's leading our business and go-to-market strategy. We're looking for $2 million in this next round of developments, which will help us develop M our MVP to a more enhanced version with better features, grow the team and sophisticate our engineering and management structure, but also most importantly, focus on scalability of sales with corporate customers, clinical institutions, and to achieve an ARR rate, uh, run rate of 500K to 1 million. I'd love to continue the conversations with those who are interested. I'm happy to have further conversations uh, sent across the pitch deck, etc. Thank you for listening. All right, thanks so much, Will. Um, I just launched a poll for FitPack. Um, let's see, let me... Okay, why, while you guys are filling up the polls, um, I just wanna say thank you so much for Right, yeah, I just want to say like, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sorry, we're a little bit over time. I hope you enjoy this event. Um, if there's anything, um, please feel free to give us feedback. We really love to hear feedback from you, both from the startup side and uh, investor side. Uh, and for investors, thank you so much for offering your opinions on these startups. We'll take your 
um, we'll, we'll take your um, polls and then we'll use that to evaluate it. We'll also reach out to you um, in terms of like our due diligence process. And if you haven't already, please sign up on our, um, on our platform. Uh, I'll send out a Google link in the chat so that you have the information. I also send out the investor form um, at the end of and the message through the, the Eventbrite if you RSVP'd over Eventbrite. Um, my email is pinpin, P-I-N-P-I-N -P -I -N, at vectors.earth. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or you want to follow up or if you're interested in any of the company. Um, I'll be happy to give you their contacts. And yeah, I hope you have a good evening and hope to see you guys on the next deal day. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Um, let me quickly pull up the polls. Thank you.